It is a great pleasure to me to declare the 62nd study week of the Italian German Historical Institute in Trento open. My name is Christoph Cornelissen. I'm a professor of contemporary history at the University of Frankfurt and at the same time also director of this institute in Trento. Music has made a name for itself as an institution specializing in Italian and German history and their manifold entanglements, especially between our two countries. Generally, ISIC, this is an acronym for Istituto Storico Italo Germanico, studies all kinds of historical problems from a broad historical perspective. Right from its very beginning in 1973, and under the guidance of its first director, Paola Prodi, the Institute has always emphasized looking into core historical problems of a European nature. This approach means our study focuses both on issues of early modern and contemporary history. Initially, we had planned to hold this conference last year, but we had to postpone it for obvious reasons. Unfortunately, we are still living under the spell of the COVID crisis, but we are trying heavily to re-establish re some kind of normalcy. Thus, I'm pleased that our study week takes place this year, online, admittedly. But it takes place because all of you have positively reacted to our plan B to hold the conference online. Please accept my cordial thanks for this acceptance. As you may gather from the sequel number of the study week, the 62nd study week, our institute has regularly devoted its time and uh, as a director, of the Institute, I need to include this reference also considerable material resources into the organization of these events. We also regularly publish the results of our study weeks and we try to do so as fast as possible. And this may be understood to all um, speakers as a kind of a first gentle reminder what's to be done in the next month to come. It does not seem to me really necessary to legitimate the choice of the topic. Choice of the topic. Because of today, because of today I have an, I have an echo. echo. Can you switch off the mic because of an echo? It does not seem to me really necessary to leg legitimate the choice of the topic of this study week because of today's political and social challenges. Environmental and infrastructural questions are high on the agenda in politics and in social discourses of all kinds. At the same time, the long-cherished self-assurance of many actors in these discussions seems to have welted away. Politicians, scientists and managers, intellectuals and publicists easily fall out with each other when it comes to solving pressing environmental and infrastructural problems. Obviously, vested interests of, all, of various kinds are vital, perhaps also occasionally narrow-minded jealousies, but there is certainly much more at issue. There are simply no ready-made answers to the complex problems we are facing today in view of a pressing climate crisis and in consequence of a state of technological development that is not sufficient anymore to safeguard the future of human mankind. In such a situation, it is more than suitable to look into history as similar junctures, not the same, similar junctures met, might be detected and similar challenges to whom our predecessors, predecessors were looking for answers. Of course, we are aware that we do not draw simple lessons from history, that's obvious. But dealing systematically with historical challenges in environmental history and also in the construction of new infrastructures may lead to a more reflexive and also a more rational discussion of current problems in the sad sectors. Now, historically speaking, so it seems to me, infrastructures can best be understood as the result of a negotiation negotiations and collective compromise processes. This constellation means that studying the complex relationship between infrastructures and the environment requires generally finely tuned interdisciplinary approaches. All of them, of course, will have to cooperate closely with experts in technical and economic questions to measure risks, economic ones, technological and actuarial, actuarial ones. And they will have to improve social acceptance levels. But leaving out history would mean losing an essential dimension that can inform us about the potential political, social and economic risks or other challenges in the planning and realization of new infrastructures. Now, having said this, and I'm coming to an end, sorry for this rather long and drawn, 
introduction, but I wanted to present very shortly our Institute's work. Now, having said this, I think Giacomo Bonan and Katja Oki have been very successful in bringing together a group of renowned colleagues from different countries to discuss some of the challenges I've mentioned before. Following the tradition of our Institute, we will do this with the perspective of a long durée, covering questions from the early modern period to our day. Now, our first keynote speaker will be Helmut Tischler. Helmut Tischler is Professor of Modern History and History of Technology at the University of Munich since 1998. And since 2009, he's also director of the Rachel Carson Center for Environment and Society. Professor Trischler has widely published on the two central concepts of our conference. I will quote only a very short selection, just three of them. Antiprocene, exploring the future of the age of humans. This is a position paper uh, uh, published in 2013. A book edited together with Martin Kohlrausch, Building Europe on Expertise, Innovators, Organizers, Networks, published in 2014. And last but not least, a book together edited uh, together with Don Donald Wooster, Manufacturing Landscapes, Nature, Technology, and Environmental History, a special issue of global environment. Now, that's it for the moment. Of course, I could go on and on. But Helmut Trischler has warned me that it is not really necessary to do this, and so we leave it at that. Thanks very much. We are very happy to have you with us, Professor Trischler, and uh, the floor is yours, and we are looking forward to your talk. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, uh, Mr. Cornelius. It's a, it's, it's a great pleasure to be with you uh, and to well kick off this uh, meeting, which promises to become very exciting. I hope I can share my screen with you. Um, and it will work as planned. Fine, so I can start uh, my presentation. The Anthropocene as a provocation to environmental history, or we could say environmental humanities writ large. And uh, here's my agenda uh, within the next 40 minutes or so. I will firstly talk about the Anthropocene as a geological concept, about the origins of the, the debate, yeah, which uh, is uh, rooted and was rooted in, in the sciences. But then uh, leap uh, frog forward to what uh, keeps us busy and interesting, the Anthropocene as a cultural concept, as a concept very much debated uh, in the humanities. And I will then talk about two positive, uh, constructive provocations. Uh, one, uh, the new narratives, the new temporalities that have emerged uh, from the debate about the Anthropocene. And secondly, a provocation, which I think is one of the biggest one when it comes to the whole debate about the new age of uh, humankind, the idea of kind of autonomous sphere shaped by technology. Um, what I really like with the concept of the Anthropocene is that it has become a, what I call a trading zone for enabling cross-disciplinary collaborations um, in many fields across the board, we could say, between the sciences, uh, the social sciences and the humanities. And um, I would emphasize as my next point, the, the boundaries between these disciplines, but also between institutions and communities that have become blurred by lessons learned through the lens of the uh, Anthropocene. And I will end uh, uh, with a, a few, uh, well, speculative um, reflections on slow violence and slow hope and uh, what could be called slow infrastructures, which um, we might uh, come back um, uh, during the, uh, the whole three days that we have, what, what such a slow infrastructure could mean. Okay, the Anthropocene as a geological concept, of, I, I have to start with this uh, nobleman in, in a double sense, Paul Crusen, Nobel laureate and a very prominent atmospheric chemist, who in some sense, coined the whole debate about uh, the Anthropocene or launched it in 2000 when he, um, uh, uh, in, in a kind of eureka moment, uh, said, no, we no more living in the uh, Holocene, we should live in the Anthropocene to emphasize humanity's impact, humanity's activity, as it's called here on, uh, quoted here on Earth and the atmosphere, the role of humankind in geology, uh, geology and ecology um, that has, led to a new geological epoch that, that was his um, idea, started with industrialization. 
this de debate about a uh, human's role in uh, altering the globe, altering the earth, has a much longer history, and I can only elaborate on a couple of, let's say, predecessors to Paul Crutzen uh, that I um, uh, have been showing here, uh, to, uh, Count before, who talked about, you know, the dichotomy between the original nature and the civilized, the man-made nature back in, yeah, in, in, in the Enlightenment uh, uh, in 1775, as you can see. Or the Italian uh, geologist and philosopher Antonio Stoppani, who already uh, uh, in one uh, decade, uh, one century later, in 1870s, talked about the Anthropozoic era, coming close to the Anthropocene, or the uh, Russian philosopher and, again, uh, uh, scientist, um, Vladimir Danatsky, who talked about the noosphere, the knowledge sphere, the man sphere, uh, in, in opposition to, uh, yeah, to the earthly uh, sphere. And then the, uh, the German um, biologist and president of the Mark, uh, German Research Foundation and also Max Planck Society, who in 18, uh, 1986 talked about the Anthropozoic. Again, kind of uh, launching the debate. This is just a few uh, persons um, who yeah, emphasized this role of humanity uh, in, yeah, in, as a geological force. And I, I would like to mention this to show you the long and uh, long durée, as uh, Mr. Cornelison just meant it, long durée uh, of this debate. But it, uh, it was um, it accelerated, one, one could say, and gained momentum uh, in the first uh, decade of the, tw of the 21st century, and particularly in 2009, when the Anthropocene Working Group, or Working Group on the Anthropocene, was uh, founded and launched by the stratigraphers and the geologists. Um, just, and here you can see Jan Salasiewicz, the one uh, and only person uh, that uh, Jan really and became... This is a short uh, intervention. Uh, we are still seeing this, the first slide. Is that on purpose, or you probably no. ah, okay? So you have to activate. Uh, you have to activate um, the presentation mode. There's something not working. Uh huh. Ah, okay, that's the second. Okay, now, 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 now it works. Yeah. Um, let me see. Um, yeah. Can you when see you that? Does it work now when I'm clicking it through? I, I've seen the second one. Can, can you choose the the, uh, the next one coming? Yeah. So this would be Paul, Kru Paul Krutzen. Does it work? I, I'm still seeing agenda in the middle of, of your slide. Uh, hmm. What can we do? Okay. Now, now, now I can see him. Okay, Paul Krutzen. Okay. Um, so I, I think then if it doesn't work the other way, so I have to work with this uh, with this mode here. Yeah. Um, yeah, that works. Oh, okay, that works. Uh, sorry, for, sorry for that, uh, but um, at least uh, you you do see my slides. Okay, I, I'm now with the uh, working group on the Anthropocene, um, and um, as I said, this uh, working group has been founded in 2009, and it is now working for um, for a dozen of years. And uh, one of our members, actually, of our conference, uh, John McNeil, who will be the final uh, speaker, is a member of the working group. I will come back to this. So a historian, actually two historians, are, you know, uh, present in defining the Anthropocene from a geological perspective. Um, what you can see here is the long delay of this process. We're still in the first stage uh, of such a working group that will then report once they have uh, finalized their deliberations, they will report on the next level, the Subcommission on Quaternary Stratigraphy, which then will report to the International Commission on Stratigraphy, will then report to the International Union uh, on Geological Sciences, and it might take uh, another decade or two before this, uh, you know, new uh, unit in time will be uh, formalized. But it can also be that it will be killed uh, if the next level, say the Subcommission on Quaternary Stratigraphy, will not uh, decide uh, with a what they call qualified uh, majority of two thirds about that uh, it does make sense to talk about a new uh, epoch and what that means, uh, you will see here. We're talking about this international chronostratigraphic chart, and we're particularly talking about the latest uh, periods, the Holocene, um, which started with the Neolithic Revolution about 11,700 years ago. And um, 
The idea is then that the Anthropocene would come on top or even uh, replace the whole Holocene, that's also open for debate, uh, would truncate the whole uh, uh, Holocene. Where do we stand now? Um, um, if within these uh, last 12 years or so, the Anthropocene Working Group has come up with a numerous uh, proposal when uh, and where to um, put the beginning uh, of the Anthropocene. And um, we can talk about, uh, or we can uh, argue that about 12 such proposals have, serious proposals have been made. And we could group them in three. One is really um, that the idea that the Neolithic revolution uh, kicked off the Anthropocene. And um, so that, um, yeah, as said, um, the, the, uh, the Anthropocene would replace the whole um, Holocene. The second one, which goes back to Paul Grutzen's idea, is that uh, everything started with industrial revolution some 200, 250 years ago, when uh, humankind heavily uh, uh, invaded and pierced the earth with its activities. And the third one is the idea of the Great Acceleration. And you might have uh, seen this uh, iconic graph here that uh, points uh, to yeah, an accelerated growth. I've used my cursor here. This is uh, 1950, 1950, always the red number. And you can see that there is a kind of uh, acceleration, in, in fact, a great acceleration, not only in Earth system trends like, like, like carbon dioxide emissions or methane or ocean acidification. Uh, but they don't do the service, we get back the money, but they don't do it. Poor service. What? To compare and uh, um, I call them again, but it sounds like they can't pick it up and don't attach it. Oh, I should have really done it properly. Sorry, there was an interruption by someone. I think I'm back to, to track. Um, but not just in the Earth system uh, trends, but also in the socioeconomic trends like foreign direct in, in, uh, investments, world uh, population, uh, water use, uh, transportation facilities, international uh, tourism. All, um, all curves, so to speak, um, go into uh, a, um, acceleration, uh, economic large scale uh, growth at the very same time. And this is an uh, iconic a graph made by Will Steffen, one of the members also, a system scientist, one of the members of the Anthropocene Working Group. And this is where we stand, um, the current state of discussion within the Anthropocene Working Group um, that goes back to a kind of internal poll of, of the 33, 34 members uh, in April 2019. And it says the Anthropocene is stratigraphically real, yeah, it's there, you can, we can see it, uh, we can see the markers, we can measure it. The Anthropocene is sufficiently different from the Holocene to constitute such a new unit of time, and the uh, anthropogenic uh, radionuclides, uh, that means, the, if you wish, the fallout that remains from atomic bomb, uh, bo uh, uh, t bombing tests, uh, is the primary marker. These radionuclides, they sit in the atmosphere and will sit, continue to sit there for hundreds of thousands of years, and if not millions of years. But there are also potential secondary markers, including plastics, uh, carbon isotype patterns, and industrial fly ash. Um, so, and what they propose is the Anthropocene should be treated as a formal chronostratigraphical unit uh, defined by a so-called so GSSP, that golden spike that you can nail somewhere on the earth to uh, really uh, showcase here is the marker uh, of this new unit. And it should, uh, should be based um, on a stratigraphic signal around, you remember, the mid uh, 20th century um, of our common era. So 1950s is uh, the beginning. Uh, there are secondary markers, uh, nice ones and interesting ones, like the broiler chicken, yeah, the bones of the broiler chicken, and you can see what humankind has done to the to the chicken, the red jungle fowl, fowl that um, yeah developed into our modern broiler chicken, and it's incredible numbers that we consume six. 65.8 billion uh, such chickens that we as, you, as uh, humankind um, are eating uh, every year. And you can see how it, how the broiler chicken grew, how, how its bo bone have grown. And uh, so there will be, uh, there will be a, 
a, a layer, actually, a, a, a stratigraphic layer in, in somewhere in the future if uh, um, archaeologists excavated the remains of our current uh, epoch that consists of these bones. So you can measure it, you can see it, and you can see how different they are, the modern broiler, compared to the Roman and late uh, medieval uh, chicken. Just uh, as, as, a, yeah, as an indicator how many of such um, potential markers are discussed within the Anthropocene Working Group, and there is not just one, there are multiple others. Yeah, but then there is also, let's say, resistance and opposition within the community of the geoscientists. Uh, for example, this gentleman here, Stanley Finney, very prominent head of the International Union on, of Geological Science, uh, Sciences, the highest body, uh, you remember, who uh, some years ago stated that the Anthropocene Epoch, uh, from his perspective, uh, or the whole debate, is no more about science, it's about political statements, it's about, you know, spoiling his discipline uh, uh, through, uh, you know, if you wish us, the humanities, that uh, bring it uh, uh, into the uh, political realm of, po of political debates and, uh, and political power struggles. So he, see, uh, he sees the whole uh, discipline under threat if, um, if there is a kind of yeah, negotiation with other disciplines. That leads me now to my second point, the Anthropocene is a cultural concept. What you can see here, you, it's hard to read it, uh, even uh, particularly in, in this mode of presentation, uh, what, what we have done uh, in my group here is to kind of map um, the, um, the conceptual history of that term. Uh, the, it starts with the Anthropocene, and you can see how many other uh, similar terms have been used basically by um, colleagues from the humanities, some of them more, let's say, witty, like the Trumpocene uh, or, or, or idiosyncratic, um, but some of them very uh, seriously meant, and uh, come back to one of them, like the Capitalocene, the idea that you can't talk about the Anthropocene, humans role uh, uh, invading uh, into Earth without um, yeah, questioning or at least debating the, the role that capitalism has um, been playing in uh, modern and recent history. Uh, some of the, uh, these terms uh, were also mapped by, some, uh, by two colleagues, uh, Jean-Baptiste Fresseau, who is among us or will be among us uh, during the conference, and Christophe Bonneau, who, for example, talked about the Thermocene, Thermocene the Phagocene, the not a scene, uh, the plantation is seen, the phosphorocene, the menocene, eurocene, and again, capitalocene. Uh, all three of uh, environmental humanities scholars that most, or uh, many of you might know, Anat Singh, uh, Ursula, uh, the um, uh, anthropologist, Ursula Heisey, the literary scholar and you know, foundational uh, figure in feminist studies and subaltern studies, Donna Haraway, and here are three of their books. Uh, which um, you know have the Anthropocene concept also center stage. Yeah, but then there are others um, like um, this gentleman here, um, 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 a landscape architect and um, also kind of philosopher, member of the Anthropocene Working Group, who uh, was one of the uh, authors of the Eco Modernist Manifesto that uh, goes back to 2015. And this Eco Modernist uh, Manifesto stated what we need is just more, uh, te more technology, more innovations, maybe a little bit smarter ones, but let's continue the path that we have established, the successful path um, of uh, human development. Um, uh, let's use our brains. Uh, to overcome the problems that we are facing today just by uh, being a little bit smarter, by be, uh, being a little bit more um, uh, altering, let's say, the, the path that we have taken, but being staying on the main road. And this idea of the eco-modernist manifesto in the eyes of, of many colleagues have kind of spoiled the Anthropocene uh, debate or concept uh, because this is not what we or many of our colleagues would, would like to see. Um, the Anthropocene has a provocation, new narratives, new temporalities. And here comes John McNeil and Nomi Reskis, um, yeah, um, 
the latter one being a prominent historian of science at Harvard University, uh, who both are, uh, and this is interestingly enough, members of this scientific body uh, of the Anthropocene Working Group that uh, are tasked uh, with um, the yeah, duty, so to speak, to define from a geological perspective the Anthropocene. That points to the openness and points to the interdisciplinary character of the whole work and the whole debate. If historians have a saying when it comes to defining and uh, debating scientific yeah, in a sense of geological uh, matters. Now, um, John has um, been one of the first also to work with the concept in a kind of conceptual way, in a heuristic way, in an analytical way, with um, the idea of the Anthropocene, with this book here, The Great Acceleration and Environmental History of the Anthropocene since 1945, and he would be much better qualified in uh, yeah, telling you what's, what's inside. All, uh, what I would like to say at this, it's, it's about infrastructures. It's mainly about energy infrastructures. It's about transport infrastructures and how these infrastructures that have exploded up since, uh, uh, let's say, the, yeah, since the Great Acceleration uh, around 1950 have altered, again, our world, have changed uh, the Earth and how humankind has really deeply intervened uh, into, into Earth. So it's, it's one of the... Uh, first uh, of such um, yeah, conceptual uses to come up with new narratives. And there are multiple, multiple others, like uh, Tipesh Chakrabarti, um, again, one of the foundational fathers of subaltern study uh, from uh, Chicago University, who uh, back already in 2009, at the beginning of the debate, talked about the climate of history and, and the role that climate change uh, should play in our narratives. And most recently, a couple of months ago in March, he then, you know, um, kind of elaborated this idea with this book here, The Climate of History in a Planetary Age, which is all about uh, the concept and the idea of the Anthropocene that should um, keep us as historians busy and really um, force us to rethink our long-standing narratives. A couple of other books that you can see here that uh, have been uh, published recently, like um, Carolyn Merchant, one of the foundational um, colleagues in, in environmental history, who has come up with a kind of synthesis of, about uh, yeah, 10 years of the Anthropocene debate, the Anthropocene and the humanities, um, or uh, Katrin Yusuf, who, who talks about, you know, uh, let's say, uh, the Anthropocene from a uh, African perspective. You can't you can't see it from a European or Western perspective only. It's so different to look from the global south to the global north and uh, vice versa. Or the book by Jason Moore, uh, one of those who coined the concept of the, uh, of the Capitalocene. And one uh, on the upper right future remain, uh, remains one of the um, yeah, outputs that we have produced um, in, in Munich uh, from what we call the cabinet of curiosity that we uh, installed uh, in Munich, in Stockholm, but also in Madison, um, as, a, as an idea to talk about materialities um, and the remains, what will, what will remain uh, in terms of material culture if, um, if we see, take this concept of the Anthropocene seriously. Just, just a couple of, uh, of observations of, of cases that have come up recently. I would like you also to point to uh, my colleague in uh, history of technology, uh, uh, Gabriel Hecht from Stanford University, one of um, one of the uh, I would say brightest and most uh, most inspiring co uh, colleagues who have has published this article here, which brings together uh, or which showcases, you know the the add-on value uh, that um, results from thinking uh, geological scales, temporal scales, and uh, human scales together in an article here um, on a um, on a mine uh, based in Gabun in in Africa, where um, miners um, um, let on 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 uranium miners uh, noticed. Um, or let's say uh, engineers that worked with this uranium that uh, was um, 
aimed at uh, feeding French nuclear reactors, noticed what they found in, in Gabon is not uh, the, the, the usual uranium-239, but a different variant. And this, uh, using this variant in French nuclear reactors would have killed, uh, spoiled these reactors. So um, they, they saw it as, as an idea to, uh, let's say, as a, as a natural laboratory, because these um, isotopes um, go back four billion years in time. They were, they were produced by Earth uh, four billion years ago, and then they 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 sit there uh, and were only excavated, say, in the 1950s and 60s by African workers, um, and then used by French engineers. So what you can see uh, uh, also, and then French scientists, or let's say uh, global scientists, um, uh, working in high um, energy physics, because what they what they noticed with this isotope. You, you can do cosmological studies, you can, you can do uh, particle physics in a different kind. So this, this became uh, a, a laboratory for particle phys physicists. What, so what you see here is a very deep time of um, Earth, uh, beginning of the Earth as, as, as planet, um, the, the, the time of the 1970s, um, the nuclear age, if you wish, and all the Cold War, uh, the colonial and post-colonial perspective, and then future even cosmological um, temporal scales that all uh, merge have merged in in this one and only story. So this is this is a wonderful example. Um, what what is what can be gained in bringing uh, different scales, temporal scales together. Um, and then I would uh, like to point you to this um, book here by Joe Galdi and David Armitage, uh, which has been widely circulated and read and disputed, particularly in the US, maybe probably the most contested book uh, in history in, the, in recent decades, the History Manifesto, arguing that what we as historians have done uh, since the, say, 1970s is way much to uh, focus on what they call short termism you know uh, the, the, the 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 few decades and maybe the one century the two centuries that we cover within our narratives and uh, and no more the broadelian perspective of the long durée not to talk about uh, uh, further um, deeper past deep histories um, and, and and what they argue is the, the the idea of the Anthropocene is one way to, to yeah to a kind of return of um, the long delay. So that is um, the the constructive provocation uh, that comes with bringing new temporalities, new temporal scales on the table. The second one is this idea of the technosphere, and the technosphere can look like this. What you see here is uh, Biosphere 2, this you know, artificial um, landscape, uh, or let's say atmosphere that was created in the 70s to mimic a kind of, um, let's say, Martian um, station or the New World um, at Mars or the Moon, uh, man-made uh, world, and um, the experiments with that, and that needed a technosphere, which you see here. Uh, it can look like this, where uh, the Anthropocene, um, welcome to the Anthropocene exhibition that we had in Munich in 2014 to 2016. This was the introduction, kind of a wall of the Anthropocene uh, uh, and the technosphere. Uh, or it can look like this. Um, these are two artworks uh, showing the technosphere from, um, from the Biennale in Venice in 2019. Or they, uh, uh, they can look like this. This is also a member, Peter Huff, um, physicist and uh, biologist from uh, the Anthropocene Working Group, who came up with the idea, has come up with the idea that there exists such a sphere, a technosphere, that is autonomous, that is dynamic, and that is global, and that should be placed to next to uh, to the geological spheres such as the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, the biosphere, the lithosphere. So an autonomous sphere, uh, and this you know runs against what we as historians, in particular historians of uh, technology and also the environment, have argued argued since the 1970s, namely that there is no autonomous technology. 
technology is socially constructed, it's man-made, it's us that define technology and, 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 uh, uh, and no such thing as an autonomous linear development uh, of a sphere, of a system independent uh, from humankind. The Anthropocene uh, Working Group and other scholars have, however, taken up this concept and have even measured the size of this technosphere. And here you can see the numbers, very uh, impressive. So we, each of us is standing one square meter, uh, uh, earth filled with 50 kilogram uh, of the technosphere. And it, uh, it's outnumbering us, uh, the mass of all humans, 100,000 times. And even more provocative, the, the, the diversity biodiversity, but one could uh, call of this uh, technosphere, the technofossil biodiversity is bigger than the biological uh, diversity. So there's more species and, uh, and um, I'm not talking about uh, specific items, I'm talking about species. So my cell phone would be one of those uh, species and the shoes that you are wearing is another one. Um, so the, this, this uh, technofossil uh, biodiversity is outnumbering the biological diversity. What a provocation that we should uh, actually also uh, respond to. And I think it's one of the primary tasks of uh, us his historians to work along those, or let's say get in, uh, get in uh, conversation in, uh, with such concepts and rethink it from, uh, uh, the, let's say, the collective wisdom of our disciplines. Yeah, uh, this brings me to the next point, um, interdisciplinary projects that yeah, span the humanities, the social sciences and natural sciences that resulted from uh, the debate about the Anthropocene. And a very early one uh, writing to uh, effort to write an integrated, integrative uh, history and future of people on Earth, the IHOPE uh, project that involved, for example, the Resilience Center in Stockholm, uh, but also many historians, uh, for example, like um, University of Melbourne, uh, Stockholm University, and, and so on. And it's still existing and producing really interesting stuff. Uh, the Anthropocene project um, that was launched by the Haus der Kultur und der Welt and uh, is also still continuing. The Anthropocene curriculum, um, yeah, the idea that there's an interdisciplinary yeah, um, uh, curriculum, as said, um, that um, is uh, put together by numerous scholars from very different fields. And the next one is taking place in, I think, only four weeks from now uh, at Venice uh, at Kafoskari, Kafoskari University. The Anthropocene Cabinet of Curiosity that I mentioned earlier, the idea of the technosphere uh, that involves many uh, humanities scholars like the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science um, and uh, that will also continue. Or the Vienna Anthropocene Network uh, of Eva Horn, uh, uh, philolo uh, a colleague in uh, Germanic studies in philology, uh, but also uh, Wagreich, uh, one of the members of the Anthropocene Working Group. Just, just as a few examples that shows to the yeah, productiveness of such an interdisciplinary um, uh, setting. Yeah, here is another setting. Uh, you remember Jan Salasiewicz, the founding father of the Anthropocene. Uh, and uh, to us, uh, much more known uh, is uh, Julia Adelaide Thomas, um, a, a colleague in, in, in history. Uh, and the two of them have come together uh, to write stories of strata and stories of history, narrations um, that, you know, um, contextualize and historicize what uh, the Anthropocene Working Group um, and uh, other geologists and earth system scientists um, colleagues are doing. And uh, we've published one of, uh, of, of, of their works, another one, a, a most recent book where they joined with Mark Williams, the current head of the Anthropocene Working Group has just come out arguing what we need is a multidisciplinary approach. But we also need, uh, um, actually, yeah, I will, no, I, I, I may be, mention, may be uh, also mentioning uh, it here, what we also need uh, to um, really 
exploit the full potential of the Anthropocene concept is a yeah, move towards transdisciplinarity, meaning that we have to involve the public, the, the different publics, I put it deliberately in the plural. Um, so, and this is also what Jan Salasiewicz noticed when he uh, created the Anthropocene Working Group right from the beginning. You can't, you can't work uh, in uh, establishing, alongside uh, the idea of establishing such a concept, if you're not addressing also the publics. And uh, the media uh, as um, the catalyst and intermediaries between science um, and uh, the public, but also directly, uh, so to speak, uh, kind of open, doing an open science um, uh, and, and transitioning to what um, Jürgen Renn, for example, head of the, one of the directors of the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science and deeply involved in that debate, and actually foundational father of a new uh, Max Planck, upcoming Max Planck Institute on uh, geoanthropology. So there will be a new in Max Planck Institute on uh, research in the, uh, on the Anthropocene, which is currently under, yeah, under construction, who has argued we, we need a new mode of knowledge production. One is, that is uh, by definition uh, interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary from the beginning on. Lessons learned, also lessons learned that we we have learned in Munich when we did this uh, exhibition here. Uh, we're still kind of claiming that we that it's, it was the the world's uh, first major exhibition uh, on the uh, concept of the Anthropocene. What we have learned um, is also um, just a few glimpses here. Um, when we when we worked uh, yeah, along the, the challenge what to display is that we can work somehow the Deutsches Museum is a museum of science and technology with our historically grown collections such as this device here this is the uh, Haber Bosch uh, synthesis early on uh, the experimental um, um, device that uh, Fritz Haber used um, to introduce this concept or, uh, or this um, what is called a serinette a bird organ uh, or the, the Otto Hahn, Fritz Strassmann, Lise Meitner table where nuclear fission was detected or this collection of rare earth that goes back to uh, around 1900. But then you have to, to, have, uh, you have to, you know, uh, to, to go out and, and uh, look for many different artifacts to showcase um, the, the Anthropocene like this invasive species here or this artwork by a um, artist from Cameroon, uh, Victor Sonna, who built a bicycle, which he called um, Guernica, actually, uh, made of scrap metal. This container, I would call it container of the Anthropocene, a Wardian case, or these uh, pipes, infrastructures, these water pipes from New York, uh, the first water pipe system, wooden system uh, of New York dating back to the 1820s, or this uh, crocheted um, yeah, coral reef and so on, or this, this uh, uh, shoe made of can toad skin, etc., etc. So, so we, we, we had to cross also into uh, inter-institutional barriers to um, uh, realize that such an exhibition is possible. And we had to make it very participatory and, um, you know, and, and cross uh, uh, um, and um, yeah, what I called earlier uh, transdisciplinary to engage the public and ask for their voices. We collected thousands, ten thousands of these uh, feedbacks to to questions that we posed. For example, how would you envision a future Anthropocene? So these are the lessons learned. Again, the Anthropocene concept stimulates grow uh, uh, both great interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary. It asks for new narratives and new temporalities. It forces uh, uh, academia and cultural institutions to leave their comfort zones and to critically reflect upon established concepts, practices, and institutional arrangements. And it, within the framework of the Anthropocene, boundaries become blurred, if not obsolete, between disciplines, between institutions. And actually, our experience also with this um, exhibition is the public is not at all shying away from such complexities of the Anthropocene concept if publics are addressed as responsible 
citizens, if you wish, as, as those who have a saying, have a voice, and are co-constructing such concepts. And the Anthropocene can even serve as a laboratory to experiment with new tools of narrating, communicating, and educating in, all, uh, in order to foster civic society and sustainability. This is why we um, recently also introduced a new unit, a unit in our Munich scientific landscape, um, and we will inaugurate it officially in, on December 1st. It will be uh, uh, generously uh, funded by the Volkswagen Foundation, what we call a Munich Science Communication Lab on planetary health. So the idea, uh, you know, the experience of the um, of the COVID crisis, that you can't have environmental health without human health and vice versa. They are inextricably bound, and uh, we have to think them together to overcome current uh, crisis. Last point: slow violence, slow hope, slow infrastructures. Um, slow violence goes back to this uh, wonderful book uh, by Rob Nixon, who. Um, uh, published uh, that book um, in uh, 2011. And the idea here is, uh, you know, that violence is often coming in a more gradual or an, an invisible way and nature. Uh, and it's uh, it's directed mostly to, uh, towards the vulnerable, to the poor and disempowered ones in society, meaning also uh, to the global south and not so much to us people in the global north. And, and violence is neither spectacular nor instantaneous but incremental, etc. And uh, he also emphasized the role of environmental justice movements and voices from the global south. And my colleague and co-director, uh, Christoph Mauch, has, you know, uh, in a sense, um, uh, put this upside down, uh, uh, arguing that what we need is slow hope to overcome and, uh, and rethink the current ecological crisis. Um, so the role of history, uh, the crucial role, um, what Mr. Cornelison also meant, the, of history, of, in this case environmental history writ large, in providing such slow hope to open up the yeah, Ernst Bloch's principle uh, uh, of hope, yeah, meaning that, that we have to you know, use the gen narrative uh, and generative power of hope that allows us to transform our minds and our worlds throughout history. So, and, and now what could this mean if we talk about slow infrastructures? What could that mean? Well, firstly, we could say infrastructures, meaning physical infrastructures, but maybe also uh, um, information infrastructures are mostly slow anyway, slow to alter, they are inbuilt into societies, they are heavy, they are large technical systems usually, like energy systems, like transport systems, which you can't, which you can't alter, which you can't transform on a short term uh, perspective. It, it needs, it needs decades, if not uh, centuries, to transform, radically transform such infrastructures. Uh, but uh, maybe the idea of uh, slow infrastructures goes deeper. It points to, uh, in my view, uh, to infrastructures that aim us to uh, uh, yeah, follow the principle of both environmental fairness and social justice. Infrastructures that allow for the integration, again, of public voices, both in planning uh, uh, such in infrastructures and in, 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 in running it, in maintaining it. And the negotiation that we need about critical infrastructures, about the criticality of such infrastructures. You may know the concept of critical uh, infrastructures, um, which is usually energy and transport, but also, uh, in, in some understand it in this way, in, a, in, a, in an extended way, culture is such a critical infrastructure. And we should point to the soft parts of infrastructures like uh, culture and media, and we have experienced in uh, in the pandemic, current pandemic, the crucial role of such infrastructures uh, to maintain our, our civic society. Yeah, and then again to stress the lessons learned from environmental history, and I think that's what we will be doing uh, over the next uh, two and a half days. Okay, so that uh, that's from my side. Thank you so. Much. Thank you everyone for joining us in this online conference. My name is Katia Occhi. Uh, I'm a researcher of early modern history at the Italian German Historical Institute in Trento, 
We have now listened to Helmut Strischer inspiring presentation dedicated to the Anthropocene as a provocation to environmental history. After his presentation, we continue the 60 second study week with a session dedicated to urban metabolism and the transformation of interland, ecology and technology. Unfortunately, uh, Professor Ball will uh, be not uh, with us due to personal problem that has arisen in, in the last few hours. We will then have three presentations this afternoon uh, with our speakers, Georg Stöger, Claudio Lorenzini and Christoph Bernhardt. As you see the, uh, before, uh, the discussion on the presentation will take place at the end of all sessions and uh, save any question of your, uh, that you have, may have for the end of the session. As uh, I told before, uh, if you would like to make question, please uh, do not raise your hand, but uh, book a slot via chat, uh, writing, uh, I have a question, and, and please only activate the microphone once we tell you to do so. And I repeat that uh, I, uh, to all participants, to mute your microphone during the event. So uh, to save bandwidth, uh, please switch uh, uh, off your webcam uh, while speakers are presenting. And now uh, we are uh, going to uh, the presentation of Georg Stöger. And uh, uh, thank you very much, Georg, to join us. And uh, Georg is an associate professor in economic, social and environmental history at the University of Salzburg. His recent research interests include the pre-industrial recycling and the reuse of goods and materials and different facets of urban environmental history and the debate on the pre-modern and modern standard of living. He just published Geschichte des Wegwerfens in Neue Politische Literatur and, und, and uh, Transformationen städtischer Umwelt, das Beispiel Linz. Today, Georg Stöger is speaking about uh, urban environmental infrastructure in the East Alpine region, 16th to 18th century. So, uh, Georg, you will have 30 minutes for your presentation, and uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, many thanks for your kind introduction. I will now try to share my screen. Uh, just a moment. So is it visible? Can you can you all see it? Yeah. Yes, Perfect. it is. OK, thanks for that. So uh, in the next 25 to 30 minutes, I will be speaking about uh, urban environmental uh, infrastructure in the East Alpine region in the early modern period. Here you can um, see an overview of my presentation. In my talk, I will try to combine different parts or aspects of urban environmental infrastructure and ask for actors, their motifs and techniques and the corresponding hinterlands. For reasons of time, I will skip the introductory parts, which actually heavily relies on the work of Sabine Bowles. Uh, and that's quite unfortunate that she won't be here today because I was hoping that she would be talking about that in uh, some moments but we can come back to that in the discussion. Uh, in brief, uh, I see urban environment infrastructure um, bound to the urban metabolism, uh, thus to material and energy flows. So it's an attempt of a systemic perspective. Uh, I will deal with three different aspects of pre-modern urban environmental infrastructure. You can see here first on um, commercial networks that supplied uh, cities with firewood and grain, second, water infrastructure, and thirdly, um, social environmental infrastructure related to urban fires and floods. I will do so by comparing three different cities in the northeastern part of the East Alpine region. Uh, you can see them on the map here, uh, Salzburg, Linz and Vienna. All three were centers of administration, trade and transport during the early modern period, albeit of a different size. You can see here um, the estimates of inhabitants uh, during the early modern period. So this should give you an idea about the size of the city. Unlike uh, Linz um, and Vienna that were part of the Habsburg Empire until the early 19th century, 
Salzburg was the capital of the independent territory Salzburg. My arguments are based on um, secondary literature and current research, uh, so the different topics are addressed with different intensity for the case studies and for different periods. Let's start with the supply of firewood and grain to central parts of the urban metabolism. Uh, like elsewhere in continental Europe, uh, in the East Alpine region, caloric energy was based on firewood until the mid 19th century. Cities demanded large quantities of wood, firewood, not only for the, the domestic use, there was also an extensive uh, commercial demand for firewood. Initially, the wood came from the forests close by or from woodland that was easily accessible, as transport costs were defining the price for firewood in the cities. To give an example from the 1730s, an upper Austrian monastery brought firewood from the Alpine foreland south of Linz to its urban residence by using the river Traun. Uh, the rafts and the logs costed almost the same as the transport and the tolls. For all three cities um, I've studied, we can detect multiple and shifting hinterlands. For time reasons, I will uh, focus on the case of mostly on the case of Salzburg. Salzburg lacked a known city forest. Also, Vienna and Linz didn't have own forests. But Salzburg was surrounded by extensive woodlands, especially to the south. Some bigger urban institutions and the archbishop himself owned woodland, uh, or they got firewood um, as a rent in kind. The rest of the population relied on firewood sold by local farmers and traders, and their activities stayed unregulated until the 18th century. For two urban institutions in Salzburg, the Municipal Hospital and the Brother House, another social institution, we can trace the supply with firewood and detect the related hinterlands over the time span of several hundred years by using account books. The earliest notes taken in the 1470s relate to wood brought from the Alpine uh, area south of Salzburg. And, uh, the firewood was obviously brought uh, to the city by the river Salzach and via the city of Hallein. Hallein, which is about 12 kilometers south of Salzburg, was a major user of firewood due to its salt works. And early on, there was a timber grill that collected the drifted logs. This corresponds also uh, to the circumstance that the rather exotic measuring unit Pfann, which is pan, in uh, English, was frequently used in the account books up to the beginning of the uh, 17th century. There is also a number of entries in the account books which hint at buying firewood directly at the salt works or at the timber grill. At the same time, the hospital uh, got firewood from the vicinity of the city, which was probably brought not by water, but on horse-drawn carts. The wood hinterland of the brother house looks similarly um, plural. Frequently, the surrounding woodlands and Hallein are mentioned in the account books. Uh, sometimes the entries explicitly mention the water transport related to the firewoods, but land transport from woodland close to the city uh, seems to have been of equal importance during the 17th, 16th and 17th century. So it seems that there were parallel and sometimes overlapping and entwined uh, networks of supply. And you can see here on this map, I might try to, to um, visualize these uh, hinterlands for Salzburg and for Linz and for Vienna. For the 18th century, we uh, lack detailed information from these uh, two institutions, but there is a household account book of a wealthy Salzburg merchant, which offers interesting insights into the firewood supply for the period of the 1730s to the 1780s. This household, the Speng Spengler family, bought substantial amounts of wood, and they also, unlike normal inhabitants, stocked it, probably to avoid higher prices. Um, the Spengler family bought their firewood directly from local farmers um, northeast of the city, and only at times at the uh, city's wood markets. The supply infrastructure seems to have been stable. The same farmers are noted in the account books over and over again. 
and sometimes they are even addressed as our farmers. I think it's interesting and rewarding to study the question of infrastructure and hinterlands from the perspective of long-term price data. We have collected price data for the cities of Salzburg and Vienna in a recent research project, which is connected to the standards of living debate. So that's completely another field. For Salzburg, our data collection is based on the aforementioned account books um, kept by the municipal hospital and the brother house for Vienna on the municipal hospital there. So this data relates to bigger users of firewood, but it can be used to get an overall view on the long-term development of urban prices for firewood. The prices correlate in an interesting way, as you can see here. Um, they grew steadily from the 16th century onwards until the mid 17th century. There's always almost a doubling of prices as it was for other goods as well. Then the prices stagnate until the beginning of the 18th century. And at that point, the lines start to diverge. In Salzburg, the prices stagnate until the inflation period of the Napoleonic Wars uh, of the 1790s, while in Vienna, firewood prices grew steadily during the 18th century. Two things are striking. There are, is a super regional convergence of prices for a large period of time, which is hard for me to understand at that point, and a divergence of prices that starts in the 18th century, albeit there are significant differences between hard and softwood. These prices seem to reflect the following developments of the wood supply infrastructure. First, we can assume an increasing demand for firewood in Vienna since the late 17th century, caused by a substantial growth in population. Higher demand and higher prices led to an expansion of the wood hinterland, which was related to the building of substantial infrastructure. Second, uh, when looking at the prices and their overall stability, we can assume a rather stable provision with firewood. There are frequent mentions of a shortage of wood in German Holznot in the sources, especially for the second half of the 18th century, but there's no hint that larger consumers of firewood, such as breweries or brick makers, left the cities. And um, the woods and also the prices uh, seem, uh, the prices suggest that the wood hinterland uh, seems cap uh, was capable of satisfying the growing demand for firewood during the early modern period because the prices, as I said, remained remarkably stable during most periods. Thirdly, there have been efforts of the city governments to control the wood supply, and they seem to have intensified during the second half of the 18th century, which was, at least in Vienna, a phase of rising prices for firewoods. Mostly, the regulation related to new official and controlled urban marketplaces for firewoods and an increased pressure on traders and buyers. But there was limited engagement uh, by the cities themselves. The city governments did not engage in trade activities or subside firewood apart from short-term short crisis. The liberalization of the firewood trade from the 1790s onwards was obviously a reaction to rising prices. You can see um, typical wood hinterland of Salzburg close to the city of Salzburg. Actually, it's almost the outskirts of Salzburg, which is, by the way, still covered with wood today. Another good vital to the daily a metabolism of a city was grain, which formed the basis of pre-modern diet. In all three cities, grain came from multiple hinterlands, but Salzburg was probably most dependent on super-regional imports. These grain hinterlands and markets lack comprehensive research, but we have some information and a comparatively large amount of sources due to the 1770s subsistence crisis. Starting in 1770, a number of failed harvests occurred, which caused rising grain prices and food shortages in many parts of Western and Central Europe. This crisis reached its peak during the years 1771 and 1772, and it resulted in a remarkable excess mortality. 
even if there were local producers, Salzburg heavily relied on the import of grain from neighboring Bavaria at the end of the 18th century, even during normal years. A contract, for example, with Bavaria issued in 1766, even specified the amount of grain that should be delivered annually to salt workers in Hallein without taxes and tolls. In any a case, grain was often the return cargo in the salt trade. There are hints um, to the grain hinterlands of Salzburg in the account books of the aforementioned Salzburg hospitals, but it's hard to sketch an overall picture for the early modern period, as it is not entirely clear if, if a producer, a trader or a wagoner got recorded. However, the locations point at purchases uh, from the city's marketplace, which is not surprising at all, but also uh, at purchases from the northern parts of Salzburg and quite frequently at imports from Bavaria and Upper Austria and probably even Hungary during the 18th century. We can see the dependency on super regional hinterlands in the 1770s crisis, and we can also observe the collapse of the supply infrastructure. The neighboring territories soon halted grain exports, which disrupted the supply infrastructure and caused severe effects. In 1771, the grain price in Salzburg almost tripled, and this led to costly efforts of the Salzburg government to better the supply and to lower the prices. Only in 1773, the prices returned to normal after the good harvest. As in other territories, the Salzburg government tried to import grain in order to bring it to the local markets and to supply the bakers. And already in 1771, the government bought grain in Udine and Trieste and brought it to Salzburg despite high transport costs. In 1772, the Archbishop requested a permit from the Austrian Emperor to import a large amount of grain directly from Hungary, which was permitted after some to and fro. The 1770 crisis is also visible in the account books from Salzburg. The Brother House bought its grain from the urban and estate storage, but the amount of the most important grain, which was usually bought, was significantly smaller than in other years, which hints at uh, substitutions. It is hard to tell where and how the Spengler merchant family got their grain. In their account books, um, a miller is mentioned frequently, and there are numerous unspecified food bills. But there are also some hints to uh, storing and substitution during this crisis. For example, the family noted the purchase of rice from Italy. Yet it should be clear that this wealthy family was hardly affected by the rising grain prices as they were used to spend annually about 1,500 gulden for food during this period. The price data for Salzburg, which you can see on the slide, for Salzburg and Vienna, shows that the grain supply networks were super regional and deeply entwined. Yet the Viennese prices stayed lower and they fell faster than the ones in Salzburg. Indeed, the crisis did not hit Linz and Vienna as hard as Salzburg. Unlike Salzburg, both cities were surrounded by highly productive grain farming and they were well connected to the Hungarian grain market, which was a domestic market uh, back then for Linz, and Salzburg, uh, for Linz and Vienna. Furthermore, the Imperial Court had established a large storing facility for grain in Vienna already during the 1720s, which aimed at buffering disruptions and at stabilizing uh, prices but it was disputed as it was not useful during normal harvests and it produced a steady and significant deficit. However, this storage was probably essential during the 1770s crisis and it seems to have lowered the prices and improved the grain supply even beyond Vienna. Yet even Vienna struggled and relied heavily on the usual imports from Hungary, which became more and more expensive as the crisis lingered on. Let's move on to urban water flows, and I will focus in, in this part of my presentation on the issue of drinking water only. Like in other pre-modern cities, most of the water infrastructure in Linz, Salzburg and Vienna was privately organized, 
and maintained and managed. It was decentralized infrastructure. In Linz, it was mostly groundwater wells. Only some urban buildings, such as the castle or the estates assembly, were supplied by a private network of wooden water pipes. And there were some public wells that used groundwater or piped water. The water infrastructure in Salzburg was quite similar. Beside numerous private groundwater wells, there was a small water pipeline coming from a nearby hill that supplied some houses and public wells in the eastern part of the city. There have been other smaller private pipelines and a rather impressive canal, the so-called Almkanal, which was maintained and constantly rebuilt as a private project of a big inner city monastery and the cathedral chapter. And it um, dates back to the late material period. This canal linked a small river eight kilometers south of Salzburg with the inner city, and it even included a tunnel. Later on, during the 16th century, the city government joined the water project and thereby it became a, a semi-public infrastructure, which supplied the western part of the city. The channel's water primarily functioned as process water, besides being used for mills and irrigation, the water was also used to pump uh, groundwater, but probably it also served as drinking water. Also, the Viennese drinking water primarily uh, came from private groundwater wells. There were some smaller and mostly private water pipelines, but the importance of groundwater wells did not change before the 19th century. So why did these solutions maintain their relevance until the building of modern uh, centralized water networks during the second half of the 19th century? These were grown systems which existed probably ever since. Most substantial uh, were um, uh, financial, technological and material limits. Water pipelines were expensive to build and maintain. The mostly wooden pipes, we have seen an example in the first presentation, did not take high pressures and they had to, pay, had to be replaced regularly. Let me give you an example from Salzburg. In the 1650s, a representative well was built on a central square in Salzburg, which should have been connected to a big cast spring uh, six kilometers south of the city. This was a project by the Archbishop, and it also involved a Dutch hydraulic expert. Despite high costs, the initial plan failed as the water pressure destroyed the wooden pipes. Later on, following other costly fiascos, a pumping station was built that costed 5,000 gulden, which was at that time equal to 25,000 day wages. So this was a substantial sum. In contrast, the groundwater wells and the small pipelines were functioning systems. In most parts of the city, um, groundwater was close to the surface. Thus, it was relatively easy to dig a well. In addition, the solution of wells corresponded with the lack of sewers, which would have been necessary if there was a steady water flow. It's remarkable that during the early modern period, the financial investment of the city governments in uh, public water infrastructure mostly stayed limited. In Linz, in 10 years, during the 1710s, an average of only 130 gulden per year was spent while the total annual uh, expenses of the city at that time were about 40 to 50,000 gulden. Usually, investments in public water infrastructure responded to necessities or certain events. The two uh, public wells on the main square, uh, we can see uh, here and here in this depiction from the 17th century, uh, they were built in the uh, 1540s, probably um, reacting to a devastating city fire. On the one hand, these wells had practical value. They supplied uh, water for the households and enterprises near the main square, as well as for the weekly and seasonal markets that were held there. And, uh, which was also important, they provided water to fight fires. On the other hand, these wells also served symbolic purposes. Uh, as the main square of a Baroque city could not be imagined without an impressive well. 
we can see some of these public wells on this uh, slides on this depiction. Uh, but most wells we can't see. Um, they were situated in the backyards uh, or the gardens and they were private infrastructure, uh, which means they were not accessible uh, by the public. Nevertheless, there was shared infra water infrastructure to some extent, but it's quite hard to observe in the sources. Sometimes um, they get visible in contracts. As a house, for example, was sold in 1750s Linz, the new owner pledged not to prohibit the use of a well by a neighboring household. More common was the sharing of work or of maintenance costs, which in some cases even found its way into the land registers. From a modern perspective, uh, it is interesting to ask for the hinterland of water. When excluding the headwater regions, most of the pre-modern uh, drinking water infrastructure did not have a hinterland, as the groundwater below the city was used. Even the water pipe network usually had a hinterland close to the city. In Linz, the two public wells on the main square were supplied with a four kilometer long water line. In Salzburg, there were the aforementioned pipeline from a hill beyond city limits, which was also about four kilometers long. And there were only two more distant projects, the canal and the failed pipeline uh, from the mountainside, which I spoke before, which I uh, illustrated before. It is worth noting that the pipeline project was unsuccessfully revived several times during the early modern period, and its spring was finally used um, for the central water network built in the 1870s. In all three cities, more distant water hinterlands began to evolve only during the second half of the 19th century. My last point in this section is the question of how stable and unquestioned was the pre-modern water infrastructure. The water infrastructure, in my opinion, was relatively stable. Yet pipelines were more, more prone to disruption uh, than the groundwater wells. The pipes got clogged frequently or fro froze during winters. During the winter. Many spring water wells, as indicated by sources from Linz, were not usable during the cold season because they were covered with straw. During this period, the city's water supply was essentially based on the groundwater wells. Given the daily necessity of water, this seems to have led to redundant solutions. Numerous houses had two wells and uh, water pipelines were often supplemented uh, by groundwater wells. Such dual, dual infrastructure also reduced the risk of disruption during droughts or flooding. These solutions um, do not seem to have been questioned on a larger scale before the 19th century. There have been uh, pre-modern discussions on the quality of water and the aforementioned larger large-scale project of a water pipeline in Salzburg also hints at some skepticism towards the use of groundwater, but we clearly lack focused research on this issue. And in the last part, I will um, uh, go to the question of social environmental uh, infrastructure. And by this, I mean societal answers uh, to environmental risks, which resulted in infrastructure. I will uh, discuss uh, two uh, different risks, um, only one uh, risk, fire, because flooding, it would be too complicated. It will be discussed in my paper. A fire posed um, permanent risk for cities, uh, since candles and oil lamps uh, were used for lighting on a daily basis. And open fire was used by households as well as many craftsmen. At the same time, fire was an unpredictable risk. Yet, larger urban fires tended to occur quite seldom, but they caused rather big damage to cities and their inhabitants. This constant threat did not pass unnoticed. City inhabitants developed a variety of answers and precautions, which can be seen as infrastructure. Early on, bigger uses of fire as bakers, brewers or metal workers were situated at the periphery of the city, which was probably also a reaction um, towards uh, the emissions they caused. And there were norms that regulated the use of fire 
and ordered, that ordered preventive measures against the outbreak of fires. These norms, usually called fire regulation, Feuerordnungen in German, were already issued during the late medieval periods and they got more and more comprehensive during the early modern period. Bigger cities were obviously ahead of smaller towns in terms of fire prevention because of an increased fire risk. In Vienna, written fire regulations date back to the 15th century. They ordered regular checks of the fire safety by the city authorities and they obliged certain craftsmen to help putting out the fire. And they set building rules that should reduce the fire risk, such as a ban of thatched roofs, and they demanded the reduction of wood as a building material and the building of M-shaped roofs, Gartendächer in German, and firewalls. As in the case of water, the fire regulations called for a principally private responsibility, which was supplemented by limited supervision of uh, the authorities. During the 17th century, and this could be seen as a reaction uh, to the threats of fire during war times, the fire regulations were published more frequently and they were expanded in a significant way. Now they demanded regular chimney sweeping and the storing of firefighting equipment. In terms of equipment, uh, the regulations in Linz demanded ladders, lanterns, hooks, hand pumps, buckets, and water basins that should, kept, should be kept ready in the attics or in the apartments. Account books and inventories show that these rules uh, seem to have been obeyed to a large extent. Traditionally, it was the night watchers that were responsible for an early detection of fires. They were supported by the tower watchmen. For Vienna, payments for tower watchmen are already documented uh, for the mid 15th century. As mentioned before, there were service duties for certain craftsmen like carpenters, masons, wagoners, and in Vienna, even barbers that were responsible for providing water basins. All these craftsmen received monetary recompensation in case of firefighting operations. The threats of a Turkish invasion caused an expansion of this infrastructure. Since the 1520s, there was a permanent fire crier, as it was called in Vienna, and three day laborers that were on standby. And by the 1560s, each quarter of Vienna had an own fire commission. And there were similar structures in 17th century Linz and Salzburg as well. Parallel to that, um, technological innovations were implemented. Most important were hoses and bigger fire pumps that reached the East Alpine region in the late uh, 17th century. Yet these pumps were small in number and their impact on larger fires was questionable. Often they lacked uh, water, uh, lack of water as well. But these pumps led to some cities, as Vienna, to the formation of some sort of proto-fire brigades. In Vienna, four day laborers were employed permanently by the city to operate the fire pump in the early 18th century. It's hard to gauge the effectivity of um, these infrastructures. In Vienna, uh, the last bigger fire um, of the early modern period occurred in 1627, while large parts of Salzburg burned down in 1818. The same fate met Linz in August 1800. Large parts of the city were destroyed in a major fire, which can be seen as a combination of an inadequate uh, firefighting infrastructure and a specific fire promoting weather constellation. A small fire near the castle, perhaps caused by an empty pipe, caused damage totaling about 300,000 gulden. Another aspect in hindsight to infrastructures is the reciprocity, it's a difficult word, and solidarity of the fires. There was substantial local support, which included housing, monetary and non-monetary donations, as the aforementioned fires in Salzburg and uh, Linz show. In addition, sorry, there were... Sorry, sorry, Georg, I would like to say that you have uh, more five minutes. Please. Yeah, I will, Thank it's you. just my, my last point. I will come Thank to you. a conclusion then. Um, yeah, there were also super regional fundraising that helped the affected persons before the advent of fire insurances. And I think we can also view it as some sort of infrastructure. Now I will come to my conclusion. Uh, 
I have four points. I think um, one important point is the plurality of hinterlands, which is a phrase coined by Sabine Bars and Martin Knoll, and I think it fits well uh, to the metabolism of firewood and grain. Second point is that uh, the entwined networks and, and these are to our grown systems and these aspects I think are visible in all my examples. And we can also put the question of reciprocity and solidarity into this uh, perspective, I think. The third point is um, decentralized systems without the hinterland, and this especially concerns uh, the case of water. And the fo uh, fourth uh, point is obstacles uh, to infrastructure or lack of infrastructure. And I think this mainly is caused by deeply rooted private responsibility during the early modern period and, as I said, financial and technical and material limits and a partial lack of infrastructure if you look at the case of fire. So that was all from my um, perspective and I'm looking forward to discussing uh, this with you. Thanks a lot. So we'll try to end uh, the presentation mode. Thank you. Thank you, Gerga. Thank you very much for your presentation. And you show us the problem that uh, early modern historians have uh, when they have to confront with Anthropocene and other categories that are more uh, adaptable for their contemporary history. But we will discuss at the end of our session. And uh, now we are going to listen uh, to Claudio Lorenzini. If Claudio Lorenz, yes, Claudio, welcome Claudio. Uh, Claudio is a research fellow at the University of Udine. He is specialized in social, economic and cultural history of the Northern Eastern Alps in early modern and modern periods. Among his paper, I quote here, common forests and private timber managing the commons in the Italian Alps, published uh, in Journal of Interdisciplinary History in this year. And uh, Claudio is also editor of uh, Via della Montagna, Lo Spopolamento Montano in Italia, e la ricerca sull'area friulana di Michele Gortani e Giacomo Pittoni, edited with uh, Alessio Fornasini. His presentation is dedicated to uh, Between Stewards and Sates, Infrastructure for Timber Transport Between Disbursement and Flow, the case, the case of Friuli in early modern period. Claudio, the floor is yours. Thank you, Katia, for this uh, presentation. Uh, then I start my uh, paper with mention one another paper by Graham Hollister Short. Uh, entitled The Other Side of the Coin, Wood Transport Systems in Pre-Industrial Europe, published in the Serious History of Technology in 1994, uh, which is one of the first contributions within the rich literature on the history of the woods, which addressed the technological problem of timber transport in modern age, for which water played a crucial role. It sorry, has, Cla I, sorry, sorry, Claudio. You, you, maybe you have a, a PowerPoint, or uh, yes, uh, uh, we don't see it. Oh, I'm sorry. Now I try to. Hmm? Oh, I'm so sorry. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is it running now? Yes, yes, we see it. Good. Hmm. Are you seeing yet? Yes. Good. Uh, this paper by Graham Alistair Short, published in 1994, is one of the first contributions uh, about the, the, the history of the wood transport by uh, water during uh, modern times. Uh, it, I think it is um, an eloquent title, uh, The Other Side of the Coin, and it could be uh, read in these uh, terms. The risk involved in the use of the alpine waters for the transport of the material as bulky as it is precious were considerable. Still, there was no way to avoid running them if you wanted to avoid long roads, often 
are useless by the wheels of the wagon and above all, cut down on transport times. It was thanks to the use of water that timber became a commodity available at a distance. And it is thanks to the wise use of water that infrastructure systems were created that allowed the disbursement, the flow and the transport of timber from the mountains to the plains that we can say consolidated during the Middle Ages and then they lasted until the arrival of the train. With the arrival of the railways in the mid 19th century, the transport of wood by rafts declined immediately. This was not the case for traditional disbursement systems, including free flows or logs remained such until the arrival of air transport systems on steel cables established during the second half of the 19th century and with them coexisted until the 60s of the 20th century. My paper is an attempt to describe the infrastructural system built for the transport of timber in the Friulian area during the modern age. Without the help of water, since the little streams which fed the main torrents, the transport of timber was not only more difficult and expensive, but often quite impossible. This close link between forests, rivers and streams had a dialectal, dialectical character. The forests were made accessible to the production of timber thanks to uh, the availability of water for transport. Within this framework described above, which seems to outline unchangeable and long-term char characteristic of the supply chain, we can see changes and conflicts. Then I will try to describe them. My goal is very simple. I put myself on that side of the coin, the transport front, that makes the gain less certain and more insecure than what were the demands of the merchant and the vast demand of the market, which would be the first side of the coin. On that side, you can see all the paradigms, even historiographical ones, that have considered the woods as an omnipresent good, Fernand Rodel, to the point of contributing to mark a wooden age, Werner Sommert, an essential asset for survival. But considering only this perspective, perspective, one risk is to offer confirmations to an obvious statement without evaluating continuity and or innovations and without considering, in fact, the other side of the coin. And then it tends to delay the story. The facets of the bad sides of the coin were many. One of these is a particular circumstance of the infrastructure used for the disbursement of these areas the so-called stue, the artificial dams of waterways built of wood and stones to create reservoirs where to emerge the logs and, once the barriers have been opened, make them flow downstream, allowing the time and costs of transport by roads to be reduced. It was an ingenious mode that required uncommon skills for its operation as well as massive quantitatives of water. The opening of these reservoirs and the escape of the logs had effects not always beneficial upstream and especially downstream of the stua, at the point that merchants who often built stuas and had the right to use them and communities who who owned the woods and rented them to the merchants, did not always maintain peaceful relations. So, before we get to lower the rafts, the chatters of my title in the Friulan language, and continues uh, to the river towards to the plains and the city of Venice, it was necessary to prepare an infrastructural system that had in the waters its fulcrum and in the stues one of its centers. I mentioned in Graham Hollister's short essay saying that is, it is one of the few synthesis papers on these aspects. But in the Eastern Alpine area, studies on this theme has 
been conducted before stories by geographers and ethnographers, especially since the 60s of the 19th. Historical research became later, and this calls into the question of the problem of the sources. The history of forest resource in the eastern alpine area is certainly among the most developed in Italy. This is due to the presence of Venice, where the most significant part of the timber produced in these areas since the Middle Ages uh, were placed. Venice was also a city built on timber, the Palificate, where there were two industries such as the Arsenale and the glassworks that needed it constantly, which had developed among the first European states as a protectionist policy of its forests. When progressively the attention has been shifted from the main place of consumption to the areas of production, it has been known since the lack of own historical sources. And this makes a considerable contribution to research, including research into transport systems, for which it is essential to use indirect sources as, for instance, notarial and judicial records. To introduce the description of the supply chain of timber in the Friulian Alpine area, I'll start from a small case, a quarrel between a timber merchant and the owner of a meadow where the timber had to pass before being placed in the water for downstream transport. In 1733, the forest of the Simon River was being cut near Mojo, a community of the Canal del Ferro. Pietro Fortino and his brother was the conductor, il conduttore, that is, who had to provide for this, the disbursement. This task had been entrusted to him by the timber merchant Biagio Motis of Udine. In November of that year, Giovanni Zanotto of Ovedasso, a village of the foot of the forest, obtained from the judge of the Abbey of Mojo to stop the condotta, the operations of disbursement. Part of the trunks had been concentrated in its meadows of roundness, and other would have been added. Concentrated logs in a meadow meant compromising the possibility of producing a forage and for a few years. And so it had been. As long as he was not compensated for the damage, Zanotto demanded and obtained to stop of the disbursement. The merchant pushed his conductor to start again immediately. He would pay off any damage that the owner of the meadows had request, requested. Evidently, interrupting the timber disbursement would have cost even more. But this was not, but it, this was not enough, and the stop was prolonged. A year later, the trial was, this, was still pending, and Pietro Fortino, the conductor, tried to list to the judge those who had suffered his damages for not having been able to proceed with the disbursement. When Zanotto had stopped the passage of timber through his meadow, Fortino had to return back to his village with all his team of workers and with 10 pairs of oxen and wait in a tavern some news. When in the following April, the work seemed to start again, Fortino and his team of men with animals approached the forest but they were faced with a further impediment, that means 30 days in the tavern for all men and 11 pairs of oxen. During the month of July, everything seemed to be settled, and then they waited to start work again in a nearby village, where they had to stop for 20 days, during which Zanotto continued to oppose their passage with weapons and with stones. Time, which passed inexorably, had caused the wooden bridges to rot and compromised the roads that had been prepared for the disbursement, the maintenance of which burdened the same conductors. Not only that, to feed the animals had been purchased high, located inside the forest where the logs were dragged, which in time was rotten. At that point, Fortino had to sell off some of the oxen and add with him to be able to cope with at least some of the many expenses he was facing. 
In Janu January 1635, the matter was not yet resolved. From the reconstruction of this episode, it is possible to recognize several important aspects of the infrastructural system for the disbursement of the forests in these areas. I'll try to list some of them. Firstly, the legal aspect. The forest in question was owned by the community of Mojo, who had leased it to the merchant Motis a few years earlier. It can be said that this situation was almost the rule for all the Friuland Mountains territory, including in the Republic of Venice. Due to the special leg legislation on commons resources, the forests in almost all were state owned, granted in usufruct to the village communities. They were also granted the right to rent them and then also earned large sums of money. The duration, the, the duration of rents varied with the extension of the essences of the hoods. Also because of the infrastructure is to be used to enhance them, the duration of the rental was never less than one year. On the contrary, it is normal reached at least two or three decades, thus respecting the times of renewal of the forest. For each stage of the timber supply chain, from the choice of plants to be felled to the transport hood of on rafts, we had to resort to organize the uh, teams of specialized workers to be used for a long time, from a few months to two or three decades. Alongside the teams of workers during the early stages of cutting and harvesting, it was essential to use animals for the dragging of the logs oxen and horses, especially which, like men, needed to feed. The quarrel between the owner of the meadows and the conduttori took place using integrated infrastructure systems, both artificial and natural. In this speci specific case, to reach the Raunis meadow, the logs were flowed along the Rio Simon, the stream that crosses the valley where the wood were cut. To do so, they would have used the stua of Rio Simon, 90, 1500 meters above sea level, where was operation is attested until 1947. Both before and after the stua, the logs would be dragged by the animals to be concentrated in a place suitable for their transport with water on the main torrents. The meadow of Raunis, about 600 meters, is in fact located not far from the river Fella, one of the main tributaries of the river Tagliamento, from where you can embark rafts. When the condotta was stopped, it was November, just before it began to snow. When it was attempted to take up again, between April and May, it was spring, and the snow was melting and streams Simon and Fella were starting to swell. Even in July, the water level is sufficient for the flow, although perhaps already navigation with the rafts can become difficult. Then the seasonality of the different steps of the full supply chain is a fact to take always into account. The presence of snow was not necessarily to an obstacle to disbursement. The sliding of the, of the logs could be carried out better thanks to the snow or ice. When the water was not close to the hoods and when the use of animals was too expensive, expensive they had to prepare artificial channels in wood and stones for the sliding downstream of the, the logs, both leaning on the ground called lisse or planches and airplanes, le so-called resine. All these elements that merge observing this case are part of the environmental system, or sorry, environment technical system that is created between hoods and water. As has been observed, the flow channels, the resine, can represent the extension of the hydrographic ne networks, as well as the stuwe become a tool, however disruptive, to regulate the flows for wood transport. 
the interconnections between ecological and technological system resulting from this system is an environment technical regime in which the institutions and the actors involved in the supply chain of the timber have a determining role, determining role to, the give, to give continuity. Even a simple warehouse where the wood is concentrated before the flow is indispensable. But if this is a meadow that is ruined and cannot be used for its main function, then conflicts emerge and compromises the system. We can see in this small case also the wider conflict between livestock farming and the timber trade. Often, if not in this specific case, the interference of commercial capital, which was the direct contributor to the building of infrastructure, determine which system to adopt, affirming it. Fella torrent is, along with Boot and the Gano torrents, one of the three major tributaries of the Tagliamento River. On it is tra transported most of the timber extracted from the Friuland Mountains. It is the largest province within the Republic of Venice. In quantitative terms, in the first 19th century cadastral operations established that almost a quarter of the wooded areas of the Veneto and Friuli region is located here. What distinguished this area in confront of the other sections of the forest of the Venetian mainland is uh, the Tagliamento rivers that in confront of Adige, Brenta and Piave was a river very difficult to sail even with rafts. Its path from the mountains to the mouth, and especially where the mountains decline in favor of the plain, is shorter than the other rivers. Its discontinuous character makes it similar to a stream that, thanks to the wide width of the bed, made it difficult simply to cross. Until the late 19th century, the Tagliamento had no bridges. It was necessary to resort to boat passes or rafts placed in some key points of the main Friuland road system. Was geography was heavily conditioned by this factor. We can use briefly some contemporary descriptions to understand how the river Tagliamento could be interpreted and what qualities and prerogatives were recognized in it. The first one is that of the Bolognese historian and philologist Leandro Alberti in Descrizione di tutta Italia. As you can read, he uh, mentioned the Tagliamento as a river when you can uh, see a marvelous fountain that has the possibility of having to make the skin of the hoods placed in stone and similarly the herbs and leaves that fall in it. Vincenzo Formaleoni, a traveler and a cartographer from Piacenza, in, this, in his book Topographia Veneta, describes the Tagliamento starting from the region where he was born, the Carnia region, which is a mountainous country and not very fertile. However, it is abundant of woods from which the Republic of Venice portrays large quantities of timber for the construction of ships. It's washed by many streams that come out of the Julian Alps. By means of this river, which is, which in its origin is very fast, factory wood is transported in the lagoons of Caorle in the Dogado, and from there by the navigational channels up to those of Venice. I skip this last description and uh, I proceed to a, a first general conclusion focusing of this short review. The first is that the abundance of water in this concept were represented by the flow rate and the size of the Tagliamento. The alpine tributaries rather than rivers are described as fast and cold water streams. The second is since the description of, of Leandro Alberti, the link between waters and rivers with forests and timbers is constantly drawn. Alberti, however, recalls that the property of these waters from their source is to make wood hard. It is a belief on which there is no other evidence and that should not be excluded, should be traced to the goodness of the marketable product, especially beaches and larches. 
In all the, the descriptions, then, and with increasing precision, the flow of the hood is mentioned and as if it were the only possible way to avail with profit of the waters of the river. Then I came to the Stue. Adolfo di Berenger, one of the most important scholars of forestry in Italy, in his uh, 1887 manual Silvi Cultura, defined the Stua, or as he called a uh, stufa, hmm, a dam as a bridge, timber made of massive wall, built of wood appropriate to be able to over overpass the water of a stream, and is equipped with exhaustive doors, and then so on. This definition is exhaustive, but necessarily generic. There are some more specific aspects that need to be described in order to, to better understand their function within the timber supply chain. I try to examine them relying on cases and examples dating back to the Friuland mountains. I will not enter into the technical aspects of the constructions of S2. The only thing that I want to highlight is that the stue must be built as a narrow course of water and between two faces of rock that function to as embankments. Otherwise, the weight of water and timber would destroy everything. At the time of the opening, in fact, the exit of the wood from the stua caused such pressure on the banks and the river that it could ruin everything that it encountered. Fulgentio Schneider, a carpenter from Sauris in Carnia at the end of the 19th century, who had seen the great stua running on the Lumiere torrent, explained that to fill it was necessary a whole week, and was one opened, the, the lake that had formed emptied in about three hours. The ground shock and even the windows of the house of the village nearby were felt. In 63, the woods of the community of, of Ampezzo, which extended towards Sauris, had been rented for 15 years to the Venetian patrician Giacomo Michiel. To succeed in extracting the wood, he had to, with intoler intolerable exp expense, build buildings and stue. Unfortunately, for the notorious flooding of rivers and waters in Carnia and of the great snow, ice and rains, to which was added the work that men that did not comply in his, in his request, the large quantities of wood that he had cut were in evident danger of going to harm. Even the effects of harsh winters, like excessive rains or vice versa winters without little snow, affect to the use of stue. Not to all the merchants who used the stue of Sauris, business went as badly as Giacomo Michiel. Because of its location, the stue was one of the centers of timber production in the Upper Tagliamento Valley. The wealthiest merchants used it for two centuries at least. In 1751, for example, the stue was owned by a group of merchants, local and foreign, the Nigris family from Ampezzo, the Fornara family from Portis, Lorenzo Dallasta from Venice, associate of Ambet, Antonio Benedetti from Ampezzo. In that year, the merchants called three experts for its maintenance, an operation that had to be conducted very frequently. The experts called were all foreigners. Giovanni Battista Zuzzi of Resiuta, Giovanni Battista Bianchi of Cadore, and Giovanni Manarin of Longarone. As these cases show, the recruit recruitment of specialized personal personnel also took place at a long distance from the production sites. In 1577, the merchant of Udine, Gabriele Vando, agreed with three lumberjacks of Sapada. Uh, for the construction of a stua between Collina Piccola and Chiaula Tomicina. The agreement provide that, provided that the stua would be kept intact by them for the duration of the lease of the woods, and to do so, the merchant recognized the very large sum of 600 ducats. 
the timber was to be taken to Tolmezzo, probably using the boot torrent. In the event that the lumber floated after the stua did some damage, there were, there were inputted to the half between the conduttori and the merchant. Similarly, even the construction of the bridges and the renovation of roads ruined by wood waged for half of them. It was strictly forbidden to allow other wooden merchants to use the same stua. Such a large investment in the construction and maintenance, in maintenance of the stua meant having to use it for at least two decades. I would like to point out that the area where the stua was planted is dotted with pastors, summer pastors precisely, where the communities bought their animals. Frequently, these pastors are called with the same name of the nearby woods and rented together. These cases, which we have briefly described, tell us that the, pro the properties of the stua were almost always timber merchants. They were responsible for the preparation and maintenance of the stua until they need it. Cases of stue constructed by village communities are rare and late. Rather, it was up to the communities to grant merchants to the power to build and use the waters. The agreed price for these concessions was included to the leases of the woods. De Beranger well described the stua, an artifact that, depending on the water flows and their slope, could range from 8 meters to 22 meters height. On all the forest basins, however, in addition to one or more stue, there was a higher number of stuetti, a little stua, which smaller plants placed in the streams that fed the torrent, whose operation was similar and complementary to that of the stue. This representation of the valley of Incaroio reconstruct the location of the stua of Ramaz, one of the largest and longest in Carnia, and the stueti placed in the streams that feed the main torrent, the Chiarzo, around the middle, the middle of the 18th century. In at least three, in, at least in three cases, the stueti are placed one after the other. The Incaroio Valley is certainly an area rich in woods, especially conifers. Such intensive use of water for harvesting shows that the pressure on the forest at that time was very, very high. These are some conclusions. By looking at this kind of data that I have collected on the stue, they can tell us something about the so-called race La Corsa to wood that has taken place in the eastern alpine forests since the end of 15th century. For Friuli, the documentation that bears witness to it seems to concentrate a little later, around the middle of the 16th century. The technical difficulties of using and the agitated waters of the Tagliamento Basin affected this delay. It was only when the pressures of demand grew in the light, of course, of the population growth, that certain forests begin to be cut down and the logs transported by water. A demonstration is in the interest of families of the, of the Venetian patriciers for the timber sector, which became very profitable in those periods. And the initial investment had to be large, as evidenced by the complaints of the patrician Giacomo Michiel about the Stua of Sauris, but equally profitable, even for the village communities. In addition to water and artificial reservoirs, such as stue, we have often encountered animals that contribute to the dis disbursement, which the staff employed in these phases had to know how to use properly. This competence, that, it, that is the use of oxen and horses for the dragging of the la uh, logs, also belongs to the envirotechnical systems, since it is in an important segment of the entire timber supply chain. For this reason, too, forests and mountains passers were often rented together. 
the merchants rented one and the other to be able to use the summer pastures to feed the animals. The woods, however, often had the same names as the pastures and vice versa. But not only, as we have seen in the case of Rio Simon, the woods would take the same name of the streams with which the logs were transported. This fact is a demonstration of the integration of the sectors and the perfect integrations of natural resources from which to obtain benefits. They should not be regarded as separate, but in, a in historical perspective as complementary. The flow through the stue was a destructive wave of leading the trunks downstream, which very often compromises the banks of rivers and streams. And this was an enormous danger, as well as an ongoing costs for the communities located on the banks of these waterways. The conflict with, with timber merchants was permanent on these fronts. However, the interests were often convergent. The higher and rent, the rents to the merchants, the greater the benefit to the communities. And a final mention about the labor market. Complex operations as building a stua, keeping it, it intact and running it, required uncommon skills. In the case of Carnia, one of the regions of the Friulian Alps, these workers were very often foreign. As we have seen, they came from the neighboring Alpine valleys or even from farther afield, such as Tyrol or Carinthia. This aspect can be interpreted in different ways. I highlight only two. The first is the mobility of the labor market in this sector of the economy, which involves the movement between the Alpine regions of teams of workers, even in, at long distances, also employed for several years in the same forest. The second and the last one is that the skills that their workers had, for example, in being able to run a stua, were not proper to the men of the village communities who owned those same woods. In fact, for Carnia, a significant part of the active male population was engaged in other, in other works, carry, carried out migration, migration from autumn to spring. They were weavers or peddlers of spices and medicines. When they left their villages, the communities were emptied of men. But at the same time, other men reached their woods, began to fill the stew. And it, this aspect of the labor market also helps us to recognize mm. what a social environmental regime could be. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Claudio, for your fascinating presentation. And, uh, and uh, thank also for this uh, deep, in deep report on the river transport system in the Italian Alps in the modern age, which uh, offer a perspective on the Alps and the community that live there and the challenges for ancient regime societies to conserve the environment, but uh, at the same time enhance the resources such as wood, as you show. So thank you. And now we, it's time to introduce uh, Professor Christoph Bernard. Professor Bernard. Yes, can you see me? Hello. Yes, thank you. I can okay. see. So if you have a presentation, uh, you can uh, you can show. And I, I, I present you. So Christoph Bernard is a historian head of the Department for Historical Research and Deputy Director at the Leibniz Institute for Research on Society and Space, IRS in Erkner, Berlin. He teaches modern and contemporary history at Humboldt University in Berlin, and his main fields of research are European, urban and environmental history. He has recently pub published article on theories of urban path dependencies and trajectories and a book on the history of uh, Berlin Schönefeld Airport in the National Socialist period. Today, Professor Bernard is going to speak about uh, the rise and fall of the car-friendly city in 20th century Europe. 
the case of Berlin in a transnational perspective. So please, uh, Professor Bernard, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the kind invitation and introduction. I hope you can hear me and I will immediately start my presentation. Uh, when uh, we did a test before, we had a strange experience that uh, either me or the presentation was visible. So maybe I will disappear in a minute in, a minute in favor of my presentation, but uh, I think uh, I can come back uh, to the uh, discussion uh, personally if that is uh, happening. So, um, do you see my presentation now? Yes, yes. Yeah? Okay. So, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, as you can see, we are jumping from the 18th or even earlier periods uh, to the 20th century, from timber and water to concrete and roads and cars. So uh, this is a sharp uh, contrast, uh, I'm afraid. Uh, but um, I'm happy to link these papers on infrastructure and adding uh, 20th century uh, perspectives. Uh, as you will see, my focus is on urban history and planning history. It's not so much the general history of transport. And my approach is a focus on institutional and organizational problems of triggers into administrative conflicts and these uh, very powerful drivers uh, of the car-friendly city in the 20th century uh, of groups in within uh, public administrations. Uh, so uh, you will always see that it's not uh, primarily on environmental, uh, let's say, uh, outcomes and impacts of uh, urban uh, automobile trans uh, auto mobility, but uh, it's on infrastructure. And uh, I'm stating that in a way we are in a transition of urban public infrastructure and especially urban auto mobility. And this uh, journal page uh, that shows the Brandenburg Gate that you see and the uh, slogan, the sentence uh, saying, it will never be like this again, that you can pass the Brandenburg Gate by car is a kind of, let's say, symbol of this transition. Uh, so uh, starting from today, we can see the rise of new concepts of urban mobility, like car sharing, e-cars, uh, public administrations uh, launch uh, systems of parking management uh, that you see uh, uh, on the right hand uh, by uh, Senate of Berlin. We have strong conflicts and the emergence on bicycle I'm still rail. looking at the first slide. Pardon? Your, present, your presentation is not moving. Not moving? Oh, that's I think pity. you have to click on the PowerPoint and then try to, to move the slides. Uh, I don't know what to do. Uh, so I, I, I try again. Uh, when we tested it before, it worked. Uh, so I, um, I finish and then try again. Uh, that's the only idea that I have. <laughs> Sorry, I uh, don't know what, uh, what the problem is. Uh, Uh, so, uh, you see it now? Now? Do you see it? Yeah. Yes, now, yes. And uh, does it move? No, you no. have to... To go to the second slide, yeah, yes, now, now, I mean, now is perfect. Yeah, okay. The, yeah, this is, fine. It's, okay. It's, sorry for the inconveniences. You should now see the second slide with the map uh, right on the right yes. side uh, on yes. the parking management system. Do you yes. see this? Yes. Okay. yes. So I'm continuing. Yes. As I said, we have uh, 
uh, so-called pop-up bicycle lanes today, in, uh, which transform uh, Friedrichstraße, major axis in the middle of Berlin. And we also see the demolition and heritageization of uh, um, urban infrastructures, like on the right uh, side, you see a photo of the demolition of Düsseldorf flyover where uh, many people said farewell to this uh, to this flyover and uh, it was a public uh, collective mourning. So there's a very ambivalent trends of uh, the transition of uh, today's uh, public infrastructure in, uh, in, in the field of uh, mobility. Um, in Paris, uh, the Boulevard Périphérique is remodeled uh, and in the at the same time, we can't talk of a kind of stagnation or collapse of uh, urban um, uh, automobile infrastructure because there's a lot uh, of money invested in maintaining and expanding uh, road networks uh, so that you can see a divergent uh, trends um, on the one hand stagnation and uh, demolition but also expansion. Uh, I hope on the right side uh, you see this uh, map of uh, the A100 uh, of Berlin which is still uh, constructed uh, and it will be a major point of issue when we will have the next uh, Sunday our um, our uh, elections, uh, our vote on the future uh, Senate of Berlin. So uh, this is a major point of issue. We have still uh, strong conflicts on the expansion of uh, motorways at the same time. My, uh, you see my outline. Um, I will make, um, oh, sorry, I have to look. Yeah, I will make four points uh, starting in 1910s. Uh, there was a first great transformation from the pedestrian city to the age of public transport. Then in the 20s, especially in Berlin, visions for urban autonomous mobility of the future were developed. We move over then to the 1950s and 60s, where we have a take off of urban automobility and uh, the construction of a large urban freeway network, especially in Berlin. And then I am discussing as my fourth point, if the 1917s were really a turning point in urban automobility and urban planning, as the main narratives and the, some narratives also in environmental history uh, state. Uh, I will discuss this uh, and then come to my conclusion. So uh, starting in, 19, in the 1910s, we observe a first uh, uh, revolution and great acceleration, if you like. I really hope, even if you can't see the details of this graph, uh, that you can, uh, let's say, uh, grasp the main message. In public transport in Greater Berlin, the rights per person uh, developed uh, from 1871 from 22 in 1917, uh, more than 350 per rights per person and year. So uh, there was a kind of really uh, revolution, transport revolution and urban mobility was accelerating uh, very strongly. Uh, at the same time, not only triggered by, uh, by urban automobility, uh, there were broad discussions on neurasthenia as a kind of uh, early uh, stress uh, debate. So, uh, all, as early in that time, we had a strong uh, transport uh, transition, if you like. At the same time, the uh, rise of automobile numbers was limited. If you only, I hope you can read, uh, see the numbers for 1926, we see a number of 200,000 cars in whole Germany. Uh, whereas we have 263,000 
motorcycles. Uh, so uh, this is a, a, a different, let's say, regime of tra private transport at the time. And uh, we had uh, extended uh, conflicts, especially in rural areas. The cartoon on the right side uh, shows a bit of it uh, on drivers uh, killing uh, people and animals in the rural context. So this is a kind of other scenario that then we know uh, from the urban uh, context. Now to uh, Berlin. Uh, at that time, a really a very segregated and politically divided region. There was a strong housing problems with overpopulated flats. Uh, there was a um, administrative separation of several cities like Charlottenburg and Neukölln, in the, um, let's say autonomous cities. And we had a, a strongly uh, scattered uh, system of private and public transport. On the other hand, uh, in the 1910s and in the 1920s, as I will show, there's a strong will to think in great visions. Uh, in the major competition uh, on urban development in uh, Berlin, um, there were, uh, they did, um, prospective calculations that we would have in 2000, 10 millions of Berliners, and they were calculating the land that they would need at the right side. You see a bit of this linear thinking. Uh, so in fact, it was only uh, 3.5 million Berliners in 2000. So this shows, uh, let's say, the yeah the, 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 the special logics in, of this uh, time. Uh, thinking. Uh, and we have uh, visions uh, to, uh, of full infrastructural supply for the region at this time. Now, uh, moving over to the 1920s, visions of public transport uh, were modified. We have now a welfare city after the revolution of 1980-1990, we can call Berlin a welfare city. There was a, a large um, uh, legal incorporation of all these independent villages and cities uh, by the Greater Berlin Law. It was by then the second largest city in the world uh, from, from the surface. Uh, and there was a created a major trust uh, for public transport uh, where uh, all the different lines and companies were amalgamated uh, to a, a unified uh, Berlin Verkehrsgesellschaft. And uh, so there, this was, a, let's say, the, the high time of public transport in Berlin. If we are looking in a comparative perspective on different cities, we find very special pathways and differences. I hope you can see, even if it's very small, uh, the numbers, only four numbers on Paris and Berlin 1929. Uh, in Berlin, uh, they counted 900 million of people uh, that were transported by tramways, whereas in Paris, it was less than a half. In contrast, Paris transported many, many more people by uh, metro and underground railways uh, than in Berlin. So every city had its own profile. And if we would go into the details, which is not possible, we would uh, could, uh, let's say, ident identify specific pathways uh, of cities in this, um, in this field. Uh, but uh, as many people think, uh, public transport and automobile visions were not contradictions. They were, let's say, uh, composed to a, to a, to a common politic uh, policies uh, in the Berlin Magistrate by Martin Wagner and Ernst Reuter. 
They, are, they were the leading protagonists of urban development at that time. Martin Wagner, counselor for building construction from 1926, and Ernst Reuter, counselor of, uh, for um, public transport and later uh, mayor of Berlin after the Second World War. So Martin Wagner, besides uh, his famous uh, housing program, uh, launched a debate on destructing certain uh, old areas uh, in favor of uh, major roads for cars, especially in the center of Berlin near Brandenburg Gate, the Ministergarten. Um, uh, he said, we don't need the old stuff, the old city. We have to develop a, a vision for an automobile world city. And uh, uh, this uh, in a time when there was nearly no cars in Berlin, <laughs> uh, let's say uh, slightly exaggerated, it was about 40,000 cars that uh, private cars that uh, circulated in Berlin at that time. So uh, this is a strong utopian thinking uh, that uh, develops and is developed by, uh, by Martin Wagner. But within the administration, there are very strong struggles. And this is what I'm interested in. So Wagner developed his own program uh, with, by his department of housing and town planning and was uh, cooperating closely with public transport and Ernst Reuter. So there was no contradiction in this regard, but there was a strong struggle with the Department of Underground Engineering. So um, my uh, claim is, or um, I, I state that this inter-administrative department struggles are of major importance behind what we see as, uh, as a result of urban development. And here we have a clear evidence that uh, general urban planning on the one hand and infrastructure and transport planning on the other hand often uh, gets in very uh, strong um, conflicts. Uh, um, I, could, I could give more details about it, but I, I don't have the time. Uh, as, I, uh, as I showed, um, there was a, a major competition on Alexanderplatz, which became the role model of Wagner's visions. Uh, the Alexanderplatz should be completely transformed. And uh, you see uh, two pictures. And the second one in 1935 shows uh, that at that time, Alexanderplatz was completely destructed to, to give place to this new vision, but it uh, lasted until the 1960s, 70s, until it was really rebuilt. Um, and again, these two factions within the um, public administration comp uh, developed competing visions uh, of uh, uh, networks of uh, highways uh, for the city, uh, which were then uh, realized in the 19th from, from the 1950s onwards. There was a formation of an automobile lobby in the 1930s, I would say. Uh, there was a, a, a growing research at universities on transport. There was, as you can see on the left, hand, left uh, side, uh, traffic sensors uh, inquiries. There was right side uh, above, there was uh, uh, trade fairs and companies uh, that uh, supported these trade fairs. And we have, I, I don't go into the details, the Autobahn Planung uh, of the National Socialists. Um, for Berlin, uh, I I'm only want to mention that the arterial roads that connect the Berlin Ring motorway to the center became very important. Uh, so some axes uh, were, were expanded and uh, this was extremely important for the inner structure of Berlin and the inner uh, urban network. Um, 
we move over to the 1950s and 60s. And this is the age of the famous um, Autogerechte Stadt, which is a, a term very wide known in Germany. Uh, it was uh, created by Hans Bernhard Reichow. Uh, you see the title on the uh, right hand, uh, Autogerechte Stadt. It was, it was a book that Reichow uh, launched and where he developed some concepts for his car-friendly city, but mainly for newly built uh, suburban areas uh, like uh, Sennestadt um, in uh, Bielefeld. And he was also uh, responsible for the reconstruction of uh, Wolfsburg. Uh, but if we look at this debate, and I've published on this in detail, we see that was, uh, uh, and, and Reichard, Reicho uh, he himself, he was uh, very disappointed to be identified with this uh, term, Autogerechte Stadt. We see that we have different versions of Autogerechte Stadt, car-friendly city in America, in the US and in Europe. So even if many, many hundreds uh, of uh, Planners, European planners were invited in the early 50s to study American highways and to study Ameri American um, automobile infrastructure. They uh, nevertheless um, took a distance, distance, uh, distant concept and, and uh, somehow criticized also the American concepts of urban highway. So, uh, for example, uh, Reichow also uh, didn't identify at all with the system of the, the, the freeways, in you know, urban freeways in, in, in the US. So we didn't have uh, uh, complete Amer Americanization of urban planning in Europe as uh, some uh, you know, scholars have uh, uh, claimed. Um, we have in contrast, and this is the, 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 the photo uh, left side, uh, different types of reconstruction, more car friendly reconstructions of some cities like Frankfurt or uh, Hanover, but we have others like Nuremberg or Münster, who were, which were traditionally reconstructed. Um, I, I definitely should have mentioned the great break of the end of the war, but uh, sorry for, uh, let's say, uh, uh, don't mention it in detail, or you all know the terrible destructions of the urban landscape in uh, Germany. And this was a precondition of what we saw in the 1950s of the, uh, let's say, uh, uh, takeoff of the, um, uh, automobile uh, age in the uh, in the German uh, cities. Uh, on a general uh, level, you see uh, by this graph that even in 1946, the number of automobile of private car was still quite low, um, less than one million. But then expanded to 1960s to um, 9 million, then 1970 uh, uh, to uh, 14 million and uh, 17 million and uh, today it's 48 million. So this is really the explosion of private car uh, traffic in uh, Germany. And uh, there was a strong, let's say, uh, policies of uh, public uh, investment in, in uh, motorways so that even the long-term transport minister for transport Zebu uh, got under pressure uh, by critiques uh, who said that uh, he was uh, prioritizing the uh, railways uh, and did not sufficiently support the um, um, auto uh, motorway uh, construction, though there were uh, strong uh, uh, tensions in this uh, area. Uh, in fact, we see, nevertheless, uh, the rise of a grand coalition for automobility. Uh, there were 
four year plans for road construction. And only if you look at the right side, this is a map where in detail was planned only the modernization and the maintaining of the infrastructural system of the motorway system. And this question um, of uh, costs to maintain infrastructure it came into my mind when I listened to uh, Helmut Trischler before, uh, that this is a, a detail uh, which is quite very interesting, uh, in discussing the costs of maintaining uh, a crucial question for our uh, automobile infrastructure. And we see uh, the, the rise of a strong lobby of ministers, managers and professors the, the Ministry for Transport pays professors to take part in the International Road Congress in Tokyo 1967. We have a strong lobby group uh, on the, from the owners of commercial trucks, um, etc. So this, uh, these lobby groups are still able today to, um, uh, to, to support and, and, and influence public uh, policies. Now to Berlin. Uh, Berlin, as I also should uh, explain more in detail, but I can't, was uh, heavily destroyed. Uh, some planners were quite content that uh, there was more space for urban um, roads uh, after the destructions. And we had this uh, pioneering figure, uh, Rolf Schwedler, who uh, promoted uh, the concept of urban freeways or Stadtautobahnen. Uh, he sent uh, a group of experts uh, that is described uh, in the, uh, to a trip to America where they studied uh, American highways. It is uh, described in the uh, article of Spiegel. So uh, don't get irritated by uh, Fidel Castro. He had nothing to do with uh, German or Berlin motorways, but it was in this number uh, that Spiegel uh, in detail uh, presented uh, and, and discussed uh, this trip of um, Berlin planners to the US. Um, so there was a transatlantic, but also a critical um, appropriation of uh, ideas, of, uh, of American ideas uh, in Berlin and uh, prospective planning um, following the concepts of Wagner from the 1920s um, was continued. So that uh, this graph shows that while um, the ratio car per capita of population in 1945 was very much uh, less than one car uh, uh, at every 20th uh, inhabitant, uh, the planning was much higher. So they calculated ahead of the uh, contemporary needs. Uh, they did a kind of uh, full supply uh, planning, prospective planning, very important at this period and not at least Western automobility was sold along the case of Berlin Highway, especially as a kind of um, demonstrative uh, project in the Cold War competition, while East Berlin uh, propagated his housing program, West Berlin uh, sold uh, its modern automobile infrastructure as a kind of Yes, um, evidence for the superiority of Western uh, lifestyle and cultures. And uh, then, as you can see on the uh, right hand, uh, the plans were still for whole Berlin, even if it was separated um, for more than uh, 10 years in 1962, uh, uh, still uh, the, the the plans were for the whole region. Uh, and th there's a question, what about the socialist car-friendly city? Normally, 
um, there's a, let's say, evidence that uh, socialist governments, urban uh, governments or two uh, prioritized uh, public transport, but this was not really the case. Right hand below you should see a kind of idle model split where only a very few cars, private cars, were present in the streets in contrast to uh, too many uh, tramways, uh, trains, but especially buses and uh, trucks. Uh, but in fact, um, East Berlin and socialist cities adopted the car-friendly city concept without uh, telling the name and uh, also uh, created uh, uh, tunnels and uh, flyovers uh, like the one you see on the left hand with uh, at Kroner Straße in East Berlin. So in some way we can talk of uh, the socialist um, countries as um, latecomers uh, in this uh, car-friendly city movement of the, the late uh, 20th century. Now, uh, my last uh, fourth point is the question uh, of, do we have a turning point in the 1970s? Do we have a move from the car-oriented city to the city-adjusted automobility, as it was uh, called, stadtgerechter Verkehr? Um, and uh, uh, this is uh, really an, an, a very open question. I would claim, that um, in the 1970s, as, a, um, as an outcome, as a kind of a consequence of strong public critique, we have uh, Mitchellich, we have J Jane Jacobs uh, strongly uh, criticizing uh, urban development. There was a move, there was a turn in the planning, urban planning communities and uh, public debate against the um, car-oriented city. So this Bologna uh, photo with the cars uh, in the public uh, space uh, was taken uh, as a kind of strong evidence for the deterioration, degradation of public space. Uh, at the same time, uh, concepts like the um, spaghetti junction that you see for Oranienplatz Berlin, uh, quite famous, uh, were also uh, criticized um, and then uh, suspended. So it seems that we have a turn, in fact, uh, but uh, as I would claim, there was a kind of uh, spatial segregation, environmental uh, segregation between sacrificed and protected areas. Uh, um, a main uh, narrative uh, amongst planning historians is that the European Monument Protection Year from 1975 was this turning point. Uh, there was journals and other campaigns uh, that, uh, let's say, celebrated and long uh, promoted this uh, turning point. We have also now a redesigning of Berlin's motorways uh, plans that you can see on the right. So there was a kind of cut uh, in the budgets too. Uh, but as I said, it was a kind of partial um, reform. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, we have still until today, uh, the rebuilding and reconstruction of uh, motorways uh, in Berlin. So I'm coming to my la uh, last uh, slide. As I hope you could see, identifying cultural and institutional triggers of urban automobility is uh, my main interest. And I hope I could show that these lobby groups, these um, urban departments, uh, municipal departments, and their um, uh, chief planners are the the main triggers, at least on the public side of this uh, business, uh, who, uh, who promote still today uh, the, uh, the ideas of expanding automobility in uh, cities. Uh, in the Berlin case, visionary thinking was 
very dominant for a long time. Um, uh, whereas in Paris, there was also uh, always a strong pressure, as far as I know, by, uh, uh, by very high numbers of cars. In Berlin, visionary thinking was for a long time ahead of the contemporary needs for uh, roads. Um, so I'm, uh, let's say, concluding that we see a fundamental ambivalence, especially uh, between stagnation and, let's say, limits to the uh, automobile city on the one hand, but also expansion, especially if we are widening our the perspective to the global south or to other countries, uh, there uh, uh, is uh, still very much alive uh, ideas of, uh, of a car-friendly city. So what uh, we could uh, say with reference to the title of my paper, there is not really a fall of the uh, car-friendly city, but more a farewell to some kinds of modern urban automobility in Berlin and other cities of the global north. Thank you for your attention.